right. Well, thank you very much for coming, everybody, today. Uh, my name is Carrie Griffith. I'm a Minnesota author. Um, I've been a finalist for a Minnesota Book Award three times, one once. And so I know what you guys are going through. And like I said earlier, it's a wonderful thing. It gives your book the notoriety and attention it deserves. And after as much work as it takes to write a book, um, really I know appreciate you appreciate it. Uh, I just have an introductory comment to make before I uh, introduce each of the authors today. Um, welcome to this Authors in Conversation panel featuring all of the 2020 Minnesota Book Award finalists in the Minnesota nonfiction category. The Minnesota Book Awards is a program of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library in the organization's capacity as the Minnesota Center for the Book. This year's book awards are sponsored by Education Minnesota, and we really appreciate and are grateful for their sponsorship, and we really appreciate the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. The Minnesota Book Awards are really unique in uh, all the United States, and we should be happy and proud to have them. Uh, let me introduce the, the books and title and authors today uh, that are with us. Um, first, Closing Time, Saloons, Taverns, Dives, and Watering Holes of the Twin Cities, published by the Minnesota Historical Society Press. Uh, that is co-authored by Bill Lindeke and Ad Andy Sturdivant. Second, we have uh, Slavery's Reach, Southern Slaveholders in the North Star State, published also by the Minnesota Historical Society Press. Great people over there. They've been busy this year. Uh, that is, was authored by Christopher P. Lehman. Then we have a uh, big, bold book, uh, Tulips, Chocolate, and Silk, celebrating 65 years of the James Ford Bell Library, published by the James Ford Bell Library. That was co-authored by Marguerite Ragnow, Natasha DeShomer. And then finally, we have Stacy Lola Drulard's uh, Walking the Old Road, A People's History of Chippewa City and the Grand Marais Anishinaabe, published by the University of Minnesota Press, another great press. We're really happy to have them. Um, thank you and welcome all you authors. Uh, we appreciate your participation. Okay, so I have one general question I'd love each of you to answer. Now, actually, if you read the question, you see there's sort of three questions in it, so you got plenty of room to move in that question. But I was really struck by how different the content of all four of these books were. Um, and I suspect researching and writing them was a huge effort. And this year, we're actually privileged to have two of our books co-authored. So that really intrigued me. I was curious how the writing process worked. So if you can share with us some of the challenges and tell us a little bit about how you, your writing practice was and how, and especially finally, I, I read in the preface, some of these were multi-year projects. If you can tell us how long your book took to write and produce. Let's start with Bill Lindeke. Hi, th thanks, thanks a lot, Kerry. Yeah, well, um, the first question about how long is about a year, I'd say, was from when we, uh, Andy and I first started talking about it to when we um, decided, when we turned in our manuscript and then edited it. But yeah, it was quite a, quite a long time. The challenge with writing about um, old bars and saloons and even new bars and saloons is that there's, there's not a lot of information that you can find um, easily. I guess that's a challenge that a lot of all the books here have in common, actually, where um, you just don't see a lot of documents. A lot of the stories and histories of these places sort of disappear if the place goes away or if the old timers uh, pass on, right? So um, just trying to find newspaper accounts of old saloons was, was challenging. Um, even we did a lot of interviewing of people, older people, um, personal experience, uh, things like that, and cobbling together um, as much as we could and the stories we could find. I, um, so, for example, one of the chapters that Andy wrote was based on just a single photograph that he had found, um, and then the whole story sort of unfolded from there. So that's kind of the, the hardest part, I think. Andy, you want to 
chime in? I'm, I actually, I'm kind of curious in these co-authored books, how you went back and forth or did you go back and forth? Can you address that at all? Yeah, I mean, it, it started with a spreadsheet. We, we um, you know, Bill and I sat down over drinks and we said, okay, let's think of every bar we can think of. And let's think of every type of bar that we want to have that we don't know the names of. And then let's think of types of bars that we don't know <laughs> and see if we can figure out what those are. And so eventually we had a list of about 100 bars that we were going to get to in, in one way or another. And, and so from there, you know, you can't have a book with 100 bars in it, I guess. You could, but um, we divvied it down to 50 and then just went right down the middle you know, 25 for Bill, 25 for me. Um, I tended to take the older ones and the Minneapolis ones. Bill tended to take the slightly newer ones and the the St. Paul ones. Um, and so from there, it was really just a matter of, you know, kind of pursuing the 25 that we'd assigned to each to each other um, individually. And then kind of at the end, actually, pretty, pretty late in the process, making sure they all flowed together well, you know, I mean, because you can only explain the you know, liquor patrol limits like three or four times in the course of a book before <laughs> you get the sense that a person's ready and, and they're like, oh, I already, I already know this. Um, but, you know, the, the voices uh, blended together pretty well. Uh, Bill and I both got our starts on the mean streets of the internet uh, writing um, <laughs> in the 2000s and 2010s. So I think we have a, I think we have a similar kind of tone um, to the to the writing that it blended together pretty well actually yeah great book really enjoyed it christopher you obviously did a ton of research i'm curious about how long it took and it, and some of the challenges you faced in uh slavery's reach in writing slavery's reach overall the project took about four or five years what i wanted to do was to go to recorder offices in different counties throughout Minnesota and look at real estate deeds and see if I could find people who were from Southern states during the years of legal slavery bought land in Minnesota. And I would spend a day either in Stearns County recorder's office or Benton County or Washington County and so forth. And then at the end of each research day, I would go home and go to a database like Ancestry or Family Search and I would look at their slave schedules, which is like a census for slaveholders. And if any of the names of the people on, on the deeds were names of people who held slaves, then I knew that those deeds were a paper trail where money from Southern plantations reached Minnesota's, Minnesotans' hands. And I spent, again, four years, four, four or five years collecting that kind of information. The biggest challenge was to make a narrative out of it. I had a list of many names, but I had to make a story out of it. So I think that was the biggest challenge that I had. Yeah, that's, that's, really, that's really interesting. What a labor, too. Marguerite, uh, you guys have what I would consider probably the only coffee table book Closing time sort of qualifies, but this this one really qualifies. This is big, bold, beautiful. You guys must have faced some real interesting challenges, um, and I'm curious about how you went back and forth. Um, it all started with Natasha's photographs. Um, we met rather serendipitously um, in 2006 um, when she first came to photograph some of our collection at the James Ford Bell Library. And on and off over the course of the next several years, she would come back and um, take more photographs. And um, my role during this time was to supply her with material and raise the money um, to do this project. So um, we spent a lot of years just collecting photographs, talking about, you know, oh, well, we don't have any pictures of ships. We need pictures of ships. And so we'd come back and she'd take more photographs and, and we'd figure it out. So um, a lot of back and forth that way. Good, Natasha. And you did all the photographs, beautiful photographs, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so challenges. Maggie did an incredible job of really opening up the library to me and um, letting me have artistic license in a rare book library, which is, is a rare thing to allow someone to have. And um, I really appreciated that. And I think 
my, the biggest problem I faced was when do we, when do we stop, stop photographing the library because it's infinite. It just goes on and on. Um, and when do we stop photographing it and decide to build this book? Um, aside from also having to raise money and, and, and all the other things that had to happen, but just kind of deciding when we had enough to tell the story of the James Ford Bell Library. Um, and and, and did, did that, did the book take, how long did it take? Well, I... <laughs> took a really long time. Yeah, more than 10 years. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, so this was a, a scheme that you hatched 10 years ago. Yes, we started taking the photographs, not really knowing that a book would be the end product, um, and then deciding that, you know, this should be a book, and then going from there. Also, time moves very, very slowly in the Rare Book Library. It's, a, it's you like actually go back in time. <laughs> so 10 years might seem like a long time, but it's, it's really realistic for this, the scope of this project. Sure, and I'm sure it wasn't 10 years no. full time. No. <laughs> Stacy, uh, your mute is on too, but yeah, there you go. Uh, one, one, you know, your book, I look at that, you must have spoke, interviewed more than 100 people, I think. So I suspect your book took quite a while to write. What were some of the significant challenges you faced and um, how long did it take to write? I did uh, my first interview in 1987 with the modern artist George Morrison. I was working on my undergraduate degree at the College of Art and Design and um, was taking a class called Native American Worldviews. And um, I am from Grand Marais um, and have Chippewa City roots as did George Morrison. And so that interview was the first one. So if you count that, it's been over 30 years since I did that first interview. Um, I interviewed a number of people then later working on my master's degree at UMD. And um, those transcripts uh, have lived in a box for all of those many years and um, it's only been within the last five years that I did the active process of writing it into a book. Yeah, nice job. Uh, now I have uh, uh, individual questions to ask, ask each of you and we're gonna go back up to the top again in, in terms of order. Bill, this first one comes to you and, and I have to say that book, Closing Times, there were so many places You've already talked a little bit about how you um, created a spreadsheet and it div you know, got it down to 50, but how did you figure out which watering holes should be included in your book? And, and, and then you talked a little bit about this, but if you could tell us a little bit more. Some of those places, I, I'm intrigued by how you researched some of those places that were only open a couple years or five years a long time ago. So if you can. Yeah. Uh, well, it was, you had to be kind of um, opportunistic. So um, when it, when there's a pl another thing I should mention, Andy and I set the book up to be sort of chronological. We wanted to try to tell a diverse set of stories um, across the geography of Minneapolis and St. Paul and a couple outside the boundaries there. Um, and, but also kind of tell a chronological story. So it starts with Pig's Eye Perrant, who was a French Canadian fur trader and sort of the founder of St. Paul in some, in, in, in a way. And, um, but, but from there, from 1840, it goes, uh, and we try to talk about different bars in specific eras. So for example, there's a place in Minneapolis called Palmer's that's still around today. But the story that I tell um, in, in that chapter is about Palmer's in the 1960s and 70s when there was a big transition going on in the West Bank area of Minneapolis. So um, we tried to sort of do it chronologically in that way, um, trying to hit a lot of different parts of the story of Minneapolis and St. Paul, the early saloon period, the boom years of the 1880s and 90s up until Prohibition where there's a big gap, of course. Um, and then there's one, bar, there's one bar in there that is from the Prohibition era. But then trying to talk about the Gateway District of Minneapolis that got erased in the 1950s and 60s. And then 
um, the, the great political smut wars of the 1970s, and then kind of ca taking it to the present day. So that, that's how we set the book up, is to bounce around and tell those stories in different periods. Yeah, I noticed that. Uh, Andy, you know, I, I, full confession, I have some familiarity of the places that you covered in your in your book. And I was cute, you know, Matt's bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guys met. At the, was it the CC Club? I think. No, it that's too glamorous. So it, oh. was, um, it, it was, uh, where did we meet Bill? Wasn't it Prochna, I think? Prochna, yeah. It was oh, Prochna. that's right. It was yeah, over yeah, drinks yeah, at Prochna. A little, little yeah. more of a tourist. Uh. Um, <laughs> I'm curious, what were a couple of you, the favorite places that you covered? I mean, there's there's kind of two answers to that because, you know, I've lived in Minneapolis for about 15 years. So, you know, and I've written about the history and culture of the Twin Cities for a lot of that time. But a lot of what I am writing about tends to be stuff that, that predates me. Um, so one of the great things about the book was was the opportunity to, to write about places where I'd actually been, <laughs> actually hung out. Like the Town Talk comes, um, comes to mind, actually, because I... Um, I used to live quite near the town talk and that was a really fun place to walk over to. Like, you know, after work on a Thursday, you'd go in and like everybody would like start clapping and you know, you'd, you'd <laughs> order a drink at the bar. There was always kind of a little show going on. Um, so the, the, to write about that as a historical kind of uh, event was, was really interesting. Um, but then, you know, because so many, newspaper writers hung out in bars uh, in the 19th century and the 20th century. Um, that tends to be how you know about a lot of these places and how you got to get a sense for what they're like. So there were a bunch of places that, you know, have been closed for a hundred years, but just the, the descriptions of them um, were just, you know, great in the way that you could, you could kind of picture what they would be like to be there. So there were places like um, a place like Jumbo Saloon or Little Jake's comes to mind. I mean, places that have been gone for, you know, a hundred years, but you know, by the time I was finished with the book, I kind of felt like I had a sense for what it'd be like to walk into those places and, you know, have a drink. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was interesting. Christopher, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you, obviously did a ton of research and some of the stuff, some of the things you uncovered, I was really struck with. I mean, in particular, some of the connections to early slaveholders in the state and in particular, early in the, in the book, you talk about St. Paul fire and Marine insurance company, which subsequently became part of travelers companies. Um, it had early roots tangentially connected to slaveholders. I, you know, I'm curious, what were some of the things that you uncovered that were um, that really sort of surprised you and stood out in terms of early slaveholder connections in Minnesota? Certainly the, the biggest surprise for me was finding out that there was a slaveholder who loaned money to the University of Minnesota. And that was surprising because I wasn't looking for that. I was actually looking at newspaper articles about someone from Stearns County, and it turned out that this particular person traveled with the person who came to St. Cloud. His name was William Aiken, and he had at least 700 slaves in South Carolina. And he loaned $15,000 to the U of M when he visited Minnesota in 1856. And that would be about a quarter of a million dollars in today's money. And what was especially surprising about that story was that Minnesota passed a law that enabled the U of M to keep the money because um, Aiken lived in South Carolina and when it joined the Confederacy, Minnesota's law said that if anyone lived in a Confederate state, they couldn't come to Minnesota and sue in its courts. So if Aiken wanted to get his money back, he couldn't. And that's how the U of M kept the money and they still owe it to this day. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. Um, let's go to tulips, chocolate, and silk. Uh, Natasha, as I mentioned it before, this is a big, bold, beautiful book. Uh, and I'm, you know, I, I said it was a, a definitely a coffee table book. It's really lovely photos and all that stuff. Can you share with us both the books, what you see as the book's mission and how you ideally would like to see it used? Um, my approach to photographing the library was to go in and tell the story of the collection, 
to create a living portrait of the books themselves. Um, in doing that, um, and looking at these artifacts and so much of the, the topics of the 17th century, um, I think both Meg and I had wonderful discussions about what is our gaze, the viewer's gaze doing when we're trying to tell the story of the history and how much is my own gaze interfering with the story I'm trying to tell of someone else's story. My daughter always explains my job as um, my mom takes pictures of pictures. <laughs> and so I, I felt there was a little, a great moral conflict in that, that what photographs, what picture am I gonna take and how is my perspective gonna change this historical document? Because in some cases you could. I could really change the way we looked at these documents just by how I photographed it um, and give a really different voice. And I realized in there, there was some real moral questions that kind of came up of, of how to look at artifacts. Um, and so that was, that was something, I think this book asked that question um, uh, of, of history in general um, and how we look at, at history in general. And, the, and Maggie, you'll speak to how the book, how she had decided to have the book actually turn around. So you really have to just move the book around and think about what, um, what are we looking at and what are we seeing, um, not just what's written. Yeah, and, well, and I'm assuming that you, part of the mission is to promote the James Ford Bell Library, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. Marguerite, that organization completely threw me. I, I opened up the book, I started leafing through it, I got to the back and I thought, they screwed up the printing of this book. <laughs> And then I read your introduction and I say, if for those of you who haven't seen it, you turn the book over, you read the first half and you just flip the book. Yeah, there you go. And you turn it over and you can read the second half. And it was a really novel organization. Can you tell us a little bit about why you, you laid it out that way? Sure. Um, as Natasha mentioned, we had a lot of conversations about how we were seeing the photographs and being the curator of the collection, I'd seen a lot of these images prior to her taking the photographs, but looking at her photographs, I realized I was seeing these images and the people reflected in them in an entirely different way. And the more we looked at them, the more we realized that all of the photographs really were changing not only our perceptions, but they might change the perceptions of the people who viewed them, not only about the historical moment that they were looking at, but also about the Bell Library. Um, for years, we were the library of uh, European expansion. And, you know, we don't call it European expansion anymore. Um, we're really a library about the history and impact of trade and cultural exchange. And most people still think of us as travel narratives and books about exploration. And so within this framework of point of view and that everyone looking at it is going to have a different perspective along with the photographer's perspective, we decided that the first half of the book um, would be what people think about the Bell Library and what it's about um, historically but then you'd flip it around and you'd look at topics that people may not expect to see in the Bell Library. Um, images of women, which, you know, off the top of anybody's head, you'd think, oh, well, this is about pre-modern men going off and exploring the world, and that doesn't involve women. And yet we found image after image after image of women, and they told their own story. Um, also cultural exchange, and, um, and nature. We have a lot of books um, that reflect the nature. So we decided that we're asking people to think about their perspectives, to think about their points of view when they view things. We wanted them to have to physically change the way they were looking at the book as well to sort of emphasize that and think about how they thought about the library too. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, the layout is, I've, I don't think I've ever seen a book like that. It, and I, I wondered when I looked at it, it must have given the printer a huge 
a huge headache, but it was it was really novel and interesting. Stacy, Stacy Drillard, uh, finally walking the old road. You write. I'm really familiar with the Grand Marais area. I go up there all the time. Croftville. I think Croftville is where Chippewa City is sort of located. You write about so many places that aren't around anymore. Were there any particular stories, one story in particular that stands out in your memory uh, when you, in, in, from people that you interviewed about Chippewa City? Well, it's difficult to narrow it down to one story. There are so many stories that um, deserve to be told. Um, and when I wrote Walking the Old Road, I set out to honor the living story of the Grand Marais Anishinaabe and the Chippewa City people, because stories are alive, they're always changing. And the more voices that um, get added in change the story. And so um, since the book was published last December, the story has already grown and grown. I've uh, been in touch with re relations all over Minnesota and the country um, who have a connection to Chippewa City. Um, so it really is a living story. It really is growing. It's really working. So I'm delighted by that. Um, if I had to um, really hone in on the story of a person that I write about, it would have to be um, Kate Frost, who is the grandmother of Jim Whipson, one of my elders that I interviewed. And he, when I interviewed him back in, the, in 2001, he said, I want to tell you the story of how my grandmother lost her land at Chippewa City. And I heard that as a challenge and a responsibility that I needed to carry out. And so the story of Katie and Katie's Point and the land history at Chippewa City, I think um, sort of exemplifies um, the local history around land and how we think about land and how the Chippewa were treated um, over time and that relationship to women and land is something that um, I touch on in the book. Um, and it is something that I discovered when I was um, plowing through the records, both at the Minnesota um, History Center and here locally at the Cook County um, Registrar's Office. When I was looking up those land transactions, I had no idea uh, what I was going to find. Um, I suspected what I would find. Um, but like oral history and the tradition of oral history, um, the facts often bear out the stories and it, it did happen in that case. And so I'd have to say um, Kate Frost is the story that, that stands out for me in Walking the Old Road. Yeah, as a, as an, a good illustration, illustrative example of other stories that you talk about in the book. I, you know, I'm really glad you guys all uh, came on today. I, again, huge congratulations to each of you. I am really glad I am not a judge because all of these books are worthy to win the Minnesota Book Awards. Just as a reminder, the Minnesota Book Award winners will be announced online on April 28th. And best of luck to you all. You all deserve it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Gary.